Good morning, everyone. I will try to speak a little bit more slowly than usual to give time for the translators. That's difficult for me, so I will have to discipline myself. Uh, look, it's, it's wonderful to be here. It's wonderful to be here in Japan to talk about this really important topic of open innovation in AI. We have done uh, quite a bit of work in the last few months to help bring the community together to better support and enable and accelerate open innovation. There's a huge amount to do. This is very much a starting point. And in that spirit, this is actually the first open uh, meeting workshop of the AI Alliance um, anywhere. So welcome to uh, being part of that experiment. Uh, let's, uh, let's head now to the first slide. I, actually, am I? Oh, got it. All right, the subject of my talk today is building the open future of AI, which is really the mission of the AI Alliance. I have a dual role. As uh, Ohara-san had introduced, I am responsible for the AI open innovation agenda at IBM, our, our strategy. And importantly, uh, I'm responsible for IBM's activities in the AI Alliance, of which we co-launched uh, late last year uh, with Meta and with, at that time, uh, over 60 organizations, and we've almost doubled it since. Now, I want to start with the question, you know, why are we here? Why are we talking about AI open innovation? Why has AI taken on such a, a new tone in the last year or two? And I, I like to think of it as, well, AI is actually starting to fulfill the initial promise that we had for it. Uh, that it actually seems to be somewhat intelligent, or at least getting there. You see that in many examples. You see that in a very vivid fashion with chat that can inter interact in a human-like fashion, in a human-like uh, level of knowledge, or almost human-like, rather. And then you can see it very vividly in the creation of, of, uh, of images, of videos now. Uh, here are a few examples, all AI created, some by open models, some by uh, closed models, but you can see the, the innovation here, which is really striking. I think it's, it's struck all of us in the last couple of years that AI is actually starting to become intelligent. Now, just to point at a couple of you know, reasons for why this has been the case, there are really two significant breakthroughs of the last few years. The first is significant advancements in self-supervised learning, namely transformer techniques that can create what we call foundation models. These are baseline models that can be built on and tuned and used for many different tasks. And importantly, this is a way, fundamentally, to encode the knowledge that is present at, you know, at, at internet scale, right? These models are trained on large quantities of data sourced primarily from the open internet, from you and me uh, and the world. So these, these models represent in some, some still limited way that collective knowledge of humanity. And that uh, is, a, is a very important vector that there's a lot to come on, but it's also a, a powerful way to think about them in terms of what should be open and how to make sure and why we must make sure that many people, that everyone can partake in the benefit of these advancements. The second one is also very important and some do, sometimes not as emphasized as the first, and that is, uh, methods of supervised fine-tuning, of instruction tuning, of ways to take these models and add specific knowledge, skills, uh, domain understanding is the very important step two here. And there have been tr an, a huge amount of progress in techniques to take these baseline foundation models, which are still a bit raw, and target them to useful applications. And in fact, that, uh, you know, if you think about the broad work of developers today, that's actually what most developers are working on, right? Ways to leverage these relatively few but relatively capable open foundation models or, or foundation models in general and trying to deploy them toward useful tasks. Now, the way that works is you start with typically an open baseline model or a baseline model. Now, you can start with a, a closed model as well, but it's actually much, much uh, easier and more straightforward to do this. In fact, there are only many things you can only do with an open model, an open foundation model. And then the, the focus of the work, and you know, in fact, the, the core of creating value, utility, capability uh, from these models is 
by, uh, by molding them, by enriching them, by tuning them to specific use cases, by embedding them into systems, systems that perform useful tasks. And that uh, is, is an extremely important and rich space to work in, and it's also the, uh, the framework to think about how to make AI both capable and safe. Now, it's not such uh, an easy domain. It's not such an easy uh, set of work to do. While on the one hand, the advent of foundation models that can be trained on broad, uh, broad amounts of data has introduced off the shelf almost, or at least seemingly off the shelf capability uh, that was not there even a couple of years ago, actually getting these, uh, these potentially very capable models, these potentially very capable uh, approaches to be useful in practice, at scale, in sophisticated domains, behaving the way you want them to behave, not behaving the way you don't want them to behave, and fulfilling a lot of the requirements needed for applications in companies, in government, uh, in everyday life is actually pretty complicated still. So this is a, a snapshot of some very interesting and compelling work uh, that's, that's part of the AI Alliance led by a company called Itematic. And it uh, is a way that actually, it's, uh, it's a way to, at the heart, start to understand and navigate this, uh, this design space for how to make AI based on foundation models useful. It's a vector that the AI Alliance and, and other members, including IBM, uh, are, are working on and, uh, and is growing. But fundamentally, this seeks to guide developers on how to take these pre-trained baseline models, foundation models, how to tune them, when to tune them, how to deploy them into uh, you know, existing patterns of application, like uh, retrieval augmented generation patterns, and how to embed them into higher level frameworks and into the systems in which they need to be embedded to perform useful tasks. Now, the key to all of this, if you think about the picture that I just painted, this is about optimizing not a model, but a system, right? We are creating AI systems, AI applications. You can name them, uh, you know, different things. But at the end of the day, you're trying to create uh, a complete capability that you can trust and that is useful. And the, the fundamental thesis of this talk, and I think a lot of what you're here today, is that that is vastly better done starting with an open baseline of technologies, open models, transparency of data, open source software tooling. And at the heart, that's what the AI Alliance is trying to foster, building, enabling, supporting this ecosystem of open technologies in AI that allow developers and organizations uh, to build, to choose, uh, to run, to own applications, and ensure that they behave the way they want them to behave. Now, let's take a short detour, not such a detour, it's actually a very important topic, but before we talk more about kind of applications and specific technical things, let's talk about what do we mean by, you know, open source AI. Now, uh, this is not a, a question that has a specific, clear answer. In fact, there are debates and discussions and healthy, healthy amount of arguments about what open means when it comes to AI. Here is an example uh, of a conference that I attended a few uh, couple of months ago, uh, put in by, by Mozilla and Columbia, where you can see uh, the expression of, you know, uh, let's call it enthusiasm in these debates uh, here where, you know, I have this rant card. We're acknowledging that this can be a complicated and sometimes, uh, sometimes irksome amount of discourse. But what is very important is that we get back to the heart of what it means to have open innovation, open technologies. And really, uh, open source is about action, goals. What can you do? Getting back to what we want to do, build AI systems that can be useful and safe and trusted, that requires getting back to first principles, the four major actions that open source is trying to enable. The ability to study a technology, the ability to modify it, to use it, and to share it. We can talk about license terms, and we should. We can talk about specific elements of technology, and we absolutely should. But at the end of the day, keeping in mind that what we're trying to do is enable people and organizations globally to perform these actions with the extremely important and capable 
technology at the heart of AI, that's, that's what we're trying to do here. Now, lots of debate will continue. Here's another snapshot of another conference, this, uh, an, a, another Linux Foundation conference last December where there was a workshop on trying to define what it means to have open technologies in AI. Now, in fact, uh, with Linux Foundation, this has uh, evolved very, very nicely. They recently published their model openness framework, which is a much more sophisticated version of trying to characterize uh, what openness means in AI technologies, especially, especially AI models. It's happening lots of other places as well, as we know well in governments around the world. Here's a snapshot of a debate uh, you know, in, in the US Senate or in the US Congress. Lots of debate and healthy debate about what, uh, what AI, what the revolution in AI of generative AI means to society, how we are going to manage that, what regulation should look like, and I think that this is, uh, has, you know, by and large been very productive. You've seen uh, the first legislation in Europe. You've seen in Japan and other places healthy debates about what, uh, what this should look like. You haven't, I think, yet seen uh, too much overreaction. I think you've seen reasonable reaction from governments that are seeking to understand the right ways to regulate, to manage the advent of AI capability in society. Now, back to what we're talking about here. When we say AI, we, we of course mean different types of technology. There's software code, traditional open source software code, there's data, but really the, the complexity I think at hand is the AI model. What is the AI model? What does openness mean for uh, an AI foundation model? And it's important to think through this not as a, a specific you know, source code artifact, but by an artifact that is uh, itself not actually the source, but the end result of a pipeline of a lot of work. Now, uh, a simplified view of a pipeline to create an AI model is, is shown here. There's training data, there is pre-processing of that data, many ways that you, uh, you filter and uh, you curate that data, and then you use it in, uh, in a pipeline to train a model which has many steps, you have the model itself, and then you have uh, what, uh, what I'll refer to here as deployment artifacts, right, in support of using the model. There's a range of, uh, of openness today in, uh, in what we call open models. Some are, are really on the right side. There is a model that uh, has its weights that are published and permissively usable. And in some cases, you have model families that are more open, that actually publish more of the pipeline that have, has been used uh, to create the model. Now, with that background, we'll go back to kind of the, the main topic of the day, the AI Alliance. The AI Alliance was founded late last year out of a need to better uh, enable and build and support and advocate for the essential role of open innovation, of open technologies for the future of AI. If you think about just going back to that picture of how we're building on these, uh, these foundation models to create useful capabilities, of all the work and complexity of navigating the design space uh, to do that well, of uh, you know, the, the healthy uh, discussions and debates about how we're going to manage the advent of AI in society, the role of open innovation is extremely important, but it's also one that looks a bit different and has a, a somewhat new set of challenges versus traditional open source software. The previous slide looked at kind of the technical lens, like, okay, how is it different uh, in terms of the technical artifacts, the elements? But if you think about what it takes to be a practitioner in, in open source today in AI, uh, there are a number of blockers, including the need, but the difficulty of bringing in broad groups of people based on uh, the need to develop you know, AI native skills, the resources required, to build models, especially building new baseline foundation models, and especially uh, if you look at expanding beyond the very narrow range of applicability so far, which has uh, primarily been in English and primarily been in text and some images, but there's a whole extremely important global sea of opportunity in broader languages, in broader modalities of data, and there are all of these challenges inherent within it. And so, to address those challenges, to help work with many other players and organizations that are, are, are deep practitioners in the open source space, 
including especially Linux Foundation, who we're partnered today with to run this event, we've started the AI Alliance. We, uh, we actually have, uh, you know, even in the early days here, uh, you know, a pretty healthy membership. Uh, this actually slide is uh, created a few weeks ago. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's slightly out of date. It, it shows a reasonable global snapshot. We've added about 15 organizations since then. And I'll highlight that um, while we have work to do, uh, we are fairly globally distributed and we have uh, you know, a compelling initial group of members in Japan starting to do very interesting work. Uh, here's the list in Japan here. Japan is a wonderful place for many things, everything technology really, uh, especially open innovation in AI. You'll hear from a number of speakers today that are practitioners in that space leading different projects here. Uh, and I want to particularly welcome a few new members, uh, Panasonic, Tokyo Electron, and Tokyo Institute of Technology. Now, the Alliance has six focus areas where we uh, are starting and working on projects to advance the field. That includes uh, advocacy work in support of open innovation. It includes uh, a significant focus on safety, security, and trust, the tooling, the evaluations, the methods needed to ensure that. Tools for application development, uh, open models and open data sets that power those models. The uh, enablement of using broader sets of hardware, of AI-optimized hardware, and skills in education. Now, in those six focus areas of the Alliance, we have in, in recent months, we've been together a few months here, uh, we have started a number of projects and specific working groups. Those are listed uh, on the right side of this slide. I'll just let you take a, take a minute and read them. I won't read them all uh, out loud. But I will focus on the, uh, the one at the bottom, which is brand new and uh, particularly um, fitting, I think, for today and for companies and for the, the technology and economy of Japan, which is the creation of an AI for Materials working group in the alliance uh, that will have a number of members from including uh, that list of Japanese organizations. And in fact, tomorrow we have a workshop with this working group to build out the agenda. AI for material science, for materials discovery, is an extremely promising topic. It ranges uh, in, in applicability to try to find new, more environmentally and climate uh, friendly and sustainable materials for industrial processes and applications. It includes the discovery of potentially important molecules uh, that can become the basis for drugs. It can uh, help in the important transition to more sustainable uh, approaches in energy and batteries and so on as well. So you'll hear a lot more about uh, all of that from that working group uh, and, you know, lots of good things that will happen tomorrow. Uh, oops. Sorry about that. Seems to be a... Lag. Okay, yeah, just a few snapshots. This is uh, an internal workshop that we had last month in California. Uh, just shows uh, some of the faces and some of the activity of the AI Alliance. And uh, indeed, it's all kind of brewed up over the last few months and is, is growing very strongly with a, with a great internal community. Uh, and we're starting to engage more broadly externally. Now, I wanted to just spend the last few minutes talking about a, a few specific opportunities and then some projects, in particular from my home institution, IBM uh, and Red Hat, uh, that are trying to, in effect, make AI more open and more usable. If you think about the juxtaposition of open source software technology and, and AI, and really by AI, I mean embodied by the AI foundation model, you see uh, a number of, of, of differences, right? And I'll just uh, kind of quickly scroll through here. You see uh, in the open source software community, extremely well-developed processes, methods, um, and, and practices for developing open source software in the open. You see uh, you know, frequent updates. You see highly structured cycles of release, uh, well-defined you know, API and software structures. Uh, you see that you know, this is indeed the product of several decades of work to the point where we have um, a well-oiled machine. Open source software is extremely healthy today. And it's at the heart of uh, you know, almost everything we do, almost everything we use, our phones, the internet, uh, servers and data centers, and, and so on. If you look at you know, today's AI models, especially you know, LLMs, large language models, it doesn't look anything like that yet. 
There are open models and there are different ranges of openness, of course, but it's very hard to have an analogous uh, process flow and, and community effort uh, in kind of model building and model tuning to, uh, to what we have in open source software. That's a solvable problem, but it's a challenge. That's kind of a state of affairs today. Now, um, what, oh, let me just go through here. So that uh, cute image of a dog represents a project from uh, IBM and Red Hat that is trying to change that, uh, something that we call Instruct Lab. Uh, this is a technique that, uh, that uh, uses uh, an automated pipeline, I'll tell you more about that in just a second, uh, to enrich a model, an open model, with uh, skills, with knowledge, uh, with understanding that is specific to a domain, in particular more complex domains uh, that exist in enterprise applications and in broader societal applications. Think about the space of, of legal, of finance, of chemistry, and so on. It uh, relies on a user, and this is not uh, an AI expert, but really more of a subject matter expert, that will define uh, a taxonomy uh, based on some high quality domain specific data, and then use that uh, to um, use another LLM to generate a training corpus, a synthetic data training corpus, uh, tailor it, uh, you know, and refine it also with another AI model, and then deploy it uh, in an efficient method to tune to instruct to an open model to add that, uh, to add that enrichment. So what it does at, at the end is enable a broader, or promises to enable, it's a brand new project, but it promises to enable a broader set of people, of developers, of subject matter experts, to partake in uh, model tuning, which is that important one, two step uh, of innovation that's happened in the last couple of years, and to make models more applicable to applications, and in, especially to assist with that system level design, that co-design between the model and its content and capability and the broader application requirements. What that uh, ends with, what the result of that is that a, a base model can be enriched, for example, with domain specific open data. So you might take an open language model and enrich it with additional language data, uh, data that's specific to uh, you know, a technical subject area like um, like legal or uh, like human resources or chemistry and so on. But then also, very importantly, you can use the same tool set uh, a private, in a private environment. A company, a government, an organization, or even an individual can use the tool set uh, to add uh, private data or knowledge or understanding into the model baseline as well. And so you have this, this two-part story where you can enrich an open model and create another better open model that merges a number of contributions together, and then you have the ability to create a private version of that that's further enriched with proprietary data that you may not want to open up. This is something that uh, the Red Hat uh, company, Red Hat as part of IBM, uh, is leading, and it's, uh, it's a new project, just launched last week, uh, but we're very excited about it. And it's one of those uh, techniques within the AI Alliance that we're working toward to try to make it uh, more broadly accessible and uh, more capable and more trusted to utilize AI models, foundation models, in applications. Uh, the last piece, I'll just talk about something we, we just also released, uh, just opened up a few days ago. So IBM has been building, uh, as you heard from Morimoto-san, building AI systems and AI models for a long time. Um, recently, you know, we have been, um, you know, the way we've done that uh, has not yet been uh, kind of fully embracing open innovation at the model level. But that has changed. We have opened up what we call our granite family of models. We did this uh, last week as well. Uh, and the first set, the first family that we've opened up is a set of open code models for code generation. We uh, have a variety of sizes in both instruct tune and baseline versions. Uh, as you can see, this, this, this does two things. First, we're trying to be more open and permissive so closer to the traditional fashion of open source software, we license these under an Apache 2 license, and we release not just the model artifact, uh, but we publish um, quite a bit of information about source data, about processing methods and training methods. And the second is they work pretty well. So you can see from the data here, uh, they're currently the high per highest performing model family 
in uh, typical code generation uh, benchmarks. So another project, uh, you know, within the broader envelope of activity in the AI Alliance and our members, there's a lot more happening in the AI Alliance uh, from the various members. You're going to hear some about uh, that today. Some of this is, uh, is on our website. Please feel free uh, to check it out to learn more. And you know, I'd be really happy to talk to anyone here about the AI Alliance, about the broader set of projects, about these projects. So come find me after the talk, or I think we have about four and a half minutes for questions now. So I can happy to open it up, and if people have a few questions, I can try to answer them right here. Anthony, thank you very much. So, まあ、Japanese we have a translation service. So please uh, uh, raise your hand and uh, Mike will come to you. Hi, thanks a lot for your, for your uh, speech. Uh, my is a gener very general question. Uh, what kind of uh, parameters, conditions, uh, do you have to suggest a new working group? Is it can, can it be made just for companies or, or can it be made also for individuals? Thank you. Yes. Uh, in the AI Alliance, we try to keep this um, lightweight and grassroots. So the most recent working group in materials, AI for materials, was formed because companies and people were interested and had some convergent ideas and goals. And so we established it. It's very easy. Fundamentally, you need alignment of uh, people and uh, some resources, right? People that want to get going and have some resource and, and, uh, and time to do that. Um, other working groups and projects in the Alliance are similar. Right? They usually happen um, when one or a few people get together, have ideas, have alignment in, in goals, and we, uh, we then can launch something. And we keep it very fluid in that way. I guess one more thing to say about that. Uh, yeah, the Alliance is not meant to be an exclusive group. It's meant to embrace and catalyze work broadly and openly. So while there are about 100 members now, we just passed our 100 member mark. Uh, and while we do have uh, working groups and focus areas that have you know, deep participation from members, and that in fact you know, members have a coordinating and organizing role, these working groups and projects uh, have, mem have individuals from uh, the broader open community. So they're meant to be open for anyone interested to partake in. I think we can take one more question, uh, if you, please, go ahead. Hello. Yeah, uh, thanks for the wonderful presentation. Uh, <coughs> now, uh, with the companies like you know, looking for more security, let's say for in the banking sector, right? So what is your roadmap uh, if for no security and you know uh, organizations going to cloud, right? And uh, you know uh, having their data more secure. Uh, security is a fo focus area where organizations, not only in banking, but uh, if you see uh, you know other organizations, other industries, they are also looking for the security of data. There should be no leakage of data, no phishing, and you know. Uh, as you all know now, the data is uh, you know hackers and all, right? So, what is your roadmap? I'm, I'm uh, just to know. Yeah, let me mention a couple of things. That's a rich topic that deserves a lot of time to go into. But let me mention two or three important points. The first is that we uh, we have to acknowledge that the space of data in, in in banking and finance, the space of applications, sophisticated regulated applications. Uh, has been rightfully the focus uh, of security uh, and regulation for a long time. And so the first is that 
you know, getting behind and updating uh, how that's done for the age of AI is kind of the, the pragmatic approach and that includes, you know, practices and regulatory frameworks and so on. Um, specifically on data, I think it's very important and you've seen me kind of try to highlight this difference. I think it's very important uh, to distinguish between open data, data that you pull from, from uh, you know, the broader society, from the internet or otherwise, or even domain specific data, but da that data that's freely given and freely available and permissively usable in the open from private data. AI Alliance, and I think no uh, reasonable practitioner of open source is advocating that all private data, data about people, <laughs> data that uh, covers sensitive topic areas of, of companies and otherwise should be open. That data should not be open. That data should be uh, rightfully guarded, private and secure. What you see though is uh, you see a, that clarity, and then you see tooling and methods that uh, can bridge that, right? Where we can use open foundational technology, including open models, to create systems that include proprietary data, but do so in a secure fashion that is owned by uh, the owner of that data. Right? So a bank that has data, uh, or any organization that owns proprietary data would own the application, the deployment of that application, any enrichment of the model or the AI system is theirs, right? It belongs to them, and if we provide, you know, better tooling, better open technology to build on, then we can enable that scenario to work well. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Thank you very much. I guess uh, we are kind of time. Okay. We'll switch to a new talk. New, uh, talk. Thank you thank very you. much. Anthony.